Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. So, um, we're talking about video calling, which has for a long time been considered the next best thing to being there, although, of course, there's a big question mark over that. Speaking of question marks, what will I talk about? Just briefly, I'll talk very briefly about a history of video calling, uh, and then I'll move to sort of situating my research on distortions and, and participants uh, in the video calling research space, which will probably prove rather familiar to some people in the audience, um, and then move on to distortions as a participant's concern. I'll talk a little bit, just very quickly, about my methodology and the data that I collected, um, and then spend quite some time on some very nice examples of my findings, um, and then talk about some upshots. And then I'll move to talking about sort of the, the upshot of the whole stuff, which is how we design for relationships, or for the relationship between technology and society, and talk about a couple of projects that might come out of that. And then you can ask me anything. Although, of course, feel free to ask me anything during the talk as well. That's absolutely fine. So video conferencing is really interesting because it has had almost the longest uh, time to sort of mainstream use of any post-industrial um, technology. You know, it took a lot longer to become even close to mainstream than telephone um, and of course a lot of other technologies similar to it. It's been around as a concept ever since there was a telephone and ever since there were photographs, um, but very difficult to realise as it turns out. There's a long history of it in fictional representations from Jules Verne and the French futurists and all those sorts of people. This is a picture from Punch, the top one up there. Um, of course, there's been depictions in um, all sorts of science fiction films and books and things like that. Um, and the earliest actual video conferencing units, or at least two-way uh, two television, um, was uh, invented in 1927 by AT&T, and they were displaying it in, 18, in 1927, which is quite incredible. But since then, it's proved very difficult to produce a consumer version of this kind of product. Now, of course, you've got Skype, and you can put it on a laptop, and you can not have it connected to anything and talk to parents and friends and family and these sorts of things. And I used to make a joke about how now that it's 2014, um, you can even do Google Hangouts from, uh, from space, which is like totally awesome. Um, although that's a competitor's product and maybe not so interesting. But of course what I've just heard is that now apparently Skype can do holograms, which is even better than doing it from space. So that's good to know that you guys are working on that. So let's talk about situating the research itself. And just briefly, some of these pictures that I show here, usually fictional representations of various forms of video calling, but they all have something to do with the talk as well. And one of them is interesting about this particular one from Star Wars is that in this version of holographic video conferencing, they're still displaying the holograms as somehow incomplete as um, you know, having various forms of distortion and things like that in them. Now, admittedly, this wasn't a galaxy uh, far, far away, a long time ago, so maybe it's just old technology. All right. Um, one of the issues about video conferencing, of course, for people who are doing it, is that even though we've got pretty good broadband network connections and even though the codecs are pretty good now, you still get various kinds of distortions, especially if you're on Wi-Fi. Um, audio obviously can be quite choppy, it can echo, it can be lagged, or it can just go missing entirely. Same with video, it can be jerky, it can pixelate, it can be frozen, it can go missing entirely. And if you're really lucky, they'll be desynchronized. So the issue is, how do people deal with that? That particular issue, in the sense of how participants deal with it as their problem, has not been looked at so much in literature. But what has been looked at? All right, so what I'm going to do now is sort of show you a whole lot of different kinds of spaces of where these sorts of things have been looked at, what they talk about, but show why none of them really deal with this. So starting with computer-mediated communication, which is in a sense where I come from, from my earlier research on internet relay chat, this is the kind of research that really looks at the social effects of designed modal features. So when something is designed into a system, so internet relay chat is a typographic system which has asynchronous uh, interaction, but it's quasi real time. Um, they tend to look at the actual features themselves and look at well, what happens when you're just using typography or what happens when your typography is quasi-synchronous but not quite really synchronous. Um, or they tend to look at sort of social issues, so how is gender done in a typographic environment or how is you know, laughter done in a typographic environment, things like that. There's been a whole bunch of theories about these sorts of things. Some of the theories up there, of course, the classic ones are cues filtered out from uh, uh, Kiesler et al, but of course that comes from the earlier um, social presence theory from um, Short, Williams and Christie. Uh, there's media richness theory, which is sort of a version of that, but uh, is about sort of trying to choose the right kind of mode for the right kind of situation. There's side, there's Walter's hyperpersonal, there's Turkle's psychosocial stuff. 
Um, and then there's been some of the stuff which is closer to what I do, which is looking at what it means when your sequencing of actual interactional turns is in some ways disrupted by the situation that you're in. And there's, there's lots of research um, on those sorts of things. So that's one area. But because it tends to look at just the designed features and because it tends to look or at social issues, it doesn't tend to look at what I call operational problems or technological failures, errors, those sorts of things. Those things are outside of the scope of that, so they're not looked at. Then there's internet studies, which is sort of similar, where they're looking at practices and cultures of various kinds of platforms. So you've got people looking at WhatsApp and SMS and blogs and Twitter and Facebook and all those sorts of things. And that's all about trying to figure out, well, what are people doing in these situations? What's special about these platforms and the people and the ways they're interacting in them? Again, though, because it's about the platforms and about the cultures within them and the practices within them, they don't tend to deal with when things go wrong very much. A little bit. They might talk about awkwardness uh, when the system doesn't work. But that's about as far as it goes in terms of those um, sorts of studies. Then there's, of course, the Designing Media Spaces study, with which you are unbelievably intimately familiar and is now incredibly intimidating to mention this material, um, which is all about what principles and techniques underpin effective and engaging video-mediated spaces or device design, all that sort of stuff. And so there's a long history of that, both in the commercial field and, of course, lots of experimental things along the way. Um, those things, of course, are they do talk about when users had problems with the system, but they tend to talk about them as experimental situations. They report on experimental situations or you know, um, limited field trials, not of commercial software, and they don't tend to spend a lot of time on literally what did the participants do sort of in their interaction in terms of making it a part of what they did, because all of it is sort of set up as experimental. Similarly, same sort of stuff, but tends to look at task effect um, there's a long history of looking at task effects, of course, Japan said Al, looking at what's the point of adding video to audio uh, and those sorts of things. You know, can um, things like uh, uh, video media communication um, support informal uh, communication, like the fish kraut stuff, where they had the, the sort of the wishing well that they looked over and talked to one another, and whether it makes a difference to detecting lying. Again, this is all about trying to do certain sorts of tasks, and there is talk in there about how distortions may affect that, but there's not a lot of time spent on how the participants actually solve the problem. Um, there is stuff about perspective differences, that is, given that we know that participants in two different situations have quite different perspectives on the interaction, they have to do things to make regular interaction or practices work. So Heath and Luff talked a lot about the asymmetries of their system, especially the fact that with their system, um, they were always on video, but to make audio happen, they had to press an actual button to make the audio um, sound at each end. Um, Relator and Jordan looked at delay-generated trouble, that is, when there are little tiny delays because of network effects, how do people deal with these things in terms of, say, answers to questions? Is a perceived delay perceived as a problem in answering a question and therefore a problem with the actual ongoing interaction. Um, but there hasn't been a great deal of look at, again, the kind of technological failures and how people deal with that. What there does tend to be is a lot of stuff about thresholds of problems. When does it become a problem? Like how, how fuzzy does audio have to be before people get upset with it? How much video is the right amount of video? When can you drop out video as compared to audio? Those sorts of, of issues. So what constitutes the acceptable quality? Um, there's a quality of service issue there as well, but I'll get to that in just a second. Um, and actually, I'll, I'll talk about that now. There is talk about latency issues in quality of service research, um, but again, that tends to be thresholds. Or they say, for example, people playing a video game got very upset when their, when their game of even um, tic-tac-toe or rock, paper, scissors is delayed by even just a little bit. So they talk about the frustration that the participants felt but they don't talk about what actually happens when they do it, right? What did they do to try and solve it beyond simply sort of saying, I'm frustrated. Uh, and of course, there's lots of research on video calling in various kinds of contexts, and I've looked at couples, and um, there's obviously been lots of stuff on home and families as well. And in that, you do start to get sort of ethnographic descriptions of how couples and, and families um, deal with troubles, getting set up, getting started, fitting into social life, um, you do get that, but you don't get a lot of the close detail of turn by turn, how do people actually incorporate that into their interaction. It's mentioned as a part of the use, part of what it means to, as it were, dwell in the situation, but it's not looked at in detail. Um, and then, of course, there's technology adoption, which is both a quality of service issue, but also a diffusion of innovation issue, where they've pretty much been, I think, um, and this is my reading situation, they pretty much tend to treat this as trouble is a self-evident thing, there's only one sort of thing, and it's bad. And it's always bad, and that's all it can ever be, right? An undifferentiated 
negative. So that's the context of a whole range of different sets of sort of fields of research which look at what it means to have trouble while you're uh, interacting in technology. But they haven't tended to look at the details of, well, just what happens, just what participants do. So that's my interest, right? Video calling distortions as a couple's problem, as a participant's problem, but not just any kind of participant, as a particular kind of, of, of set of participants doing particular kinds of things because that's why they're using the technology, right? So I, I don't want to lose sight of the fact that these are couples talking. This particular uh, image, by the way, is taken from a postcard set which was um, uh, created in 1900, a French postcard set. Um, and I just, I, I just love the way that all this technology is all, is all put together. Anyway, so what do I do? I'm an ethnomethodologist, uh, which is a really long word, which is really quite simple. It just means people's methods. Um, the complicated version of that is that what we're interested in is a version of ordinary reasoning. So what I, the way that it's, it's sort of uh, better ex ex explained is that it's situated, it's methodical, it's self-explicating. All these things are displays of accountable reasoning. That is reasoning that when I do something, you're going to hold me to account for it. You're going to treat that as being in some way related to the interaction, as in some way related to what we're doing and how we do it together. Um, and it's all about trying to figure out where the orderliness is here. So as opposed to the earlier sort of structuralist, functional sorts of stuff of, of Parsons, Garfinkel had a problem with that sort of thing because he thought that, you know what, the problem with the 10,000 foot view is it assumes that the order just happens like this. The order is above. The order is found by the researcher. Whereas Garfinkel's point was, we're not judgmental dopes or robots. We are making order. We're achieving order every moment as we do it. We're achieving the orderliness of society. Garfinkel said there's order in the plenum which is a nice way of putting it. So that spawned also conversation analysis and membership categorization analysis, which is a particularly uh, interactionally oriented version of looking at the orderliness. That's where you're trying to find the orderliness in turn-by-turn -turn interaction. Why does one turn lead to another? How does one turn look forward? How does a turn also look backwards? And how do you know what's going on in terms of the order of turn-by-turn-by-turn? -turn -turn? And more importantly, how do participants know? The critical thing about the term ethnomethodology and the term conversation analysis is that these are things that people do and analysts do at the same time. They're one and the same. They're not different. Um, it's also worth noting that we should build into this um, other sorts of allied fields like, such as uh, um, Chicago School of Ethnography and those sorts of things, especially Goffman, who was looking at similar sorts of issues but from a, with a different sort of way of getting at the data. The data that ethnomethodology and conversation analysis in particular is very interested in, in getting to um, is stuff that is in empirical collections, it's naturally occurring if at all possible, and it's highly inspectable. So it relies a lot on transcripts um, and increasingly on actual videos and things like this that are actually shown along with um, the, uh, the presentations or the, um, or the articles themselves. Uh, it look, tends to look at interactions, but there's also field observations and some interviews and sometimes diaries and sometimes lab experiments. Garfinkel did some. They've sort of fallen out of favour with, um, with the ethno people outside of HCI. Of course, inside HCI, lab experiments are still done. What I want to add into this is the concepts of affordances and technologised interaction. I know you're familiar with affordances. It's been long talked about. It's a way of looking at what's going on in the world in terms of artefacts, environments and people. And the idea is that there are stable action relationships between actors and material objects in the meaningful world. And that's the critical bit, right? The meaningful world. Right? Yes, it's true that these things are, in a sense, dumb and they're always there. There's a, there's a realist, materialist aspect to this. But the fact of the matter is animals and humans, or humans or animals as well, I guess, are, are highly creative. And when we see something, we don't just see the material thing in and of itself. We see what we can do with it, basically. Um, Ian Hutchby uh, took this concept of affordances and moved it very cleanly, or merged it very cleanly with conversation analysis in 2001 um, in his book on communication and technology. He called this intimacy at a distance. And he was interested in, in finding out how in particular communication technologies worked as a material frame that was inescapable in some sense, um, but they didn't determine the trajectory of actual interactions themselves. That these material frames in which we're talking are in fact resources for interaction, for making meaning, 
just like anything else, in a sense, as a resource for making meaning, right? Just like the physical room itself is, so too is the actual medium itself. Hutchby was largely actually looking at other sorts of um, other sorts of, of, of or other people's research. Although in 2005, he also did look at mobile phones and was looking at how they how they worked in terms of affordances. Um, but I thought this was a particularly valuable way of looking at distortions in particular, because distortions are things that are endogenous to video calling. They're completely inescapable. They do happen, and you can't stop them. So they're outside of your control. They're material in that sense. You have to deal with them. But you can choose, in a sense, how to deal with them. That, to me, is why they were interesting, and also why this affordances way in was a particularly useful sort of vocabulary for talking about it. So what I did was, um, in the end, I got six novice couples, although I actually signed up uh, 24 couples. But the rest of them all dropped out due to all sorts of problems, which is an interesting issue in and of itself. But in the end, I got six long distance couples. They'd all been couples for at least a year. They got to stay in their respective homes. And then I used a remote recording system that I set up. Um, they had two month trials with no set tasks. And they didn't have to stop using other technology. It was just, here, try video calling. See whether it makes a difference in terms of maintaining your distance relationships. What I knew would happen, because I've been testing stuff for a while, is that there would be trouble. And my interest was in when would the trouble occur and what would they do with it. So I was waiting for endogenously occurring distortions. And they did occur. The couples had between 5 and 11 conferences, so you know, sort of almost one a week over that two week period. There were 145 cases that I found where distortions were not let pass. Now, it's critical to note that you know, dropouts of audio and, and glitches in video happen absolutely all the time. But most of them are just let pass. They don't make enough of a difference, right? They don't pass that quality of service, or they do pass, rather, that quality of service sort of threshold test, and they're not paid attention to. So I was interested when the participants themselves drew each other's attention to some sort of problem, some sort of distortion, and then treated that as needing to be coped with. Not repaired. I'm going to get to that in a second. Not just repaired. Um, of those, for what it's worth, about 50% were audio. And the rest was split between video or combined audio and video problems. Um, in terms of the amount of conversation time that was disrupted, the minimum time was 3.6%. The median was about 8%. And one poor couple, who you will see today, 42% uh, of, their, of their total talk time was disrupted by this stuff. Incredible. Now, what's interesting about the way that these couples responded to the interactions is that about 40% of the time, they did try to remedy the technology itself with the internal um, various sorts of sliders that they could choose audio bandwidth, they could, they could change video bandwidth, they could do all sorts of stuff like that. And they did choose to do that a lot of the time. I won't be showing you any of that material today. That's a wholly different sort of talk and quite complex. What I was interested in in particular, I did look at it in my dissertation, but it's not in this talk. Um, what, I, what I'm interested in in particular were the content remedies, which is about 30% of the time when something went wrong and the, and the repair was to try and fix the content, right, the informational stuff that went wrong. But the really interesting stuff was the 31% when there were non-remedial coping responses to distortions. That is, the participants didn't try to fix content that went wrong. They didn't try to fix the technology and stop it going wrong. They did something else. They did something quite different. And in fact, what they did was they used the distortions as a resource to do something intimate. Generally, it was always about intimacy. So let's look at that. Let's start with something sort of simple. Um, what I want to show you first is a conversational pair of distorted audio, the kind of thing that happens all the time in regular interaction, face-to-face, co-present, uh, on the telephone, and also um, in video conferencing as well. So it's pretty simple. The audio will be quite hard to hear, but I'll show you a transcript after. Play. Why is it not playing? I don't know why that's not playing, but OK, I'll talk you through the transcript. So Hal says, she broke out the cake. That's how it sounds to Eve. She broke out the cake. And Eva says, the what? The what is an absolutely standard uh, repair initiator. What Eva's done in the what is to locate that something went wrong in the prior turn, the what. She even locates more or less where it was. She broke out, she unbroke out the cake. The was the last thing before the problem. And so the is the first thing that Eva says. And then she says, what? Which is the marker of what goes in that space. And Hal just does a very classic standard repair. She broke out the cheesecake. He repeats his entire turn in the clear. 
And Eva says, oh, that's nice, and they go on, right? And nothing is mentioned. It's not relevant that the sound cut out. The, uh, the material was simply reproduced, very simply. But that doesn't always happen. And what I found was particularly interesting for these couples, and this is specifically related to the fact that they were doing being couples in a video call, uh, was that um, sometimes when audio dropped out, when they happened to be talking about their relationship or something very close to their relationship, not at other times, when those things occurred, then they would actually potentially um, spend time trying to figure out whether or not the technology had gone wrong or whether or not there was something else at stake. And the something else at stake was something to do with the relationship. So let's hope that this video works. Oh, goodness me. Here we go. Why my video? Someone surprised sleep on the couch. Yeah. Uh, someone surprised sleep on the couch. Yeah. Um. Someone surprised sleep on the couch. Three. Wait, what? Someone surprised sleep on the couch. Yeah. Uh, uh. Someone surprised sleep on the couch. Right, so what's important here is that this is a couple who are talking about arranging a shared vacation. They're going to go on vacation with each other. They haven't seen each other in months, and that's really great. It's a very important sort of thing to do if you're in a distance relationship, to have these vacations and to arrange them. But because they're both students, they're also poor, so they can't afford to go on vacation to some cool place by themselves, so they're going with friends. And what they're talking about is how they're going to manage the hotel room arrangements. It's cheaper to have more people in one room, but if you do that, you lose out on the chance for intimacy. So you've got a relational issue that you need to work out here. So let's just look at the, at the transcript. So Des is proposing the possibility of, well, if we get a room which has got a separate bedroom and then a living room area, someone could probably sleep on the couch. That's what he's talking about. But it doesn't come out that way. It comes out as, um, someone could probably sleep on the uh, three. And Kay says, wait, what? Now, the difference between wait, what as a repair and the what, which was in the previous one, is that wait, what just halts what Des is doing in midstream, right? stop. And it doesn't actually locate what went wrong. It just indicates that something has gone wrong. And that's what's particularly important. It's not a locator of what went wrong, just that something did go wrong in the prior turn. So she says, wait, what? Now, Des does what Hal did in the previous example. He starts to repeat the turn, the immediately prior turn, which is the common response to doing a repair. Someone could probably sleep on, the, sleep on did it cut out? So he stops himself in the middle of repeating his own line, stops, cuts off on on, and then he asks, did it cut out? Note that also at the same time, that bracketed O from K below that is that K comes in while Des is saying someone can probably the sl of sleep. She overlaps and says O. So there's an issue here. Des is in the middle of producing a standard repair, a repetition of the prior material. But as he gets partway through that to sleep, he hears K go O. Oh. Now that might indicate that that's not what Kay wanted from wait what. That wait what was different to just repair prior material. So Des cuts off right after that and he asks, did it cut out? He specifically asks whether the technology went wrong or not. Kay says, yeah. He says, oh, some could probably sleep on the couch, right? And he just finally repairs that same turn in the same way. So what's interesting here is that it suddenly becomes relevant to know whether or not it was the technology that cut out or something else. Because if Des had asked, did it cut out, and Kay said, no, what do you mean someone can sleep on the couch? They're going to have a Barney, right? There's something problematic in terms, or potentially problematic, in terms of the relationship. They didn't have a Barney anyway. No, they didn't. No, just, just completely smoothed over by mentioning the technology. So that's audio. Now, audio is sort of dealt with often in terms of that conversational repair mechanism. Um, similarly, visuals were rarely repaired. They're let go much more often than audio. But again, what I found was that when video distortions did occur, repair, if it occurred at all, again, only occurred in these relational situations when somehow it made, it was important that the, or the video was seen. All right, so let's hope this one works. All right. Mm -hmm. All right. You have no teeth. <laughs> Blurry. It looks like it's like sewed shut. <laughs> All right, I'll turn. 
turned up my quality. It's still choppy. I wish it was better. Me too, but it's not. This is why you can't date people far away. Uh. Very funny. Did you like that? What'd you do? Did you wink? Mm-hmm. <laughs> Here, um, oh boy. Can you see that? <laughs> yes, I saw it. All right, so this is really interesting because you've got them talking about the fact that it's choppy. You've got them talking about the fact that in line eight and nine, all right, I'll turn up my quality, it's still choppy. So they're talking not only about the fact that there is trouble going on, both audio and especially audio, but some video, and that they know there are technological solutions, right? Turning up the quality is their, that's their way of glossing what it means to use the bandwidth slider. So I'll turn up my quality. It's still choppy. I wish it was better. And then Kay says, me too, but it's not. And then she teases him. This is why he can't date people far away. But she knows it's a tease. Des says, yes, I know. And while he's doing that, she smiles. He's looking away. And then she does this exaggerated wink. And then she does another one. But you can see in that second one, it kind of goes missing. She goes from sort of one spot to another and then back again. And you don't see that big wink. And Des says, very funny. Now, at that point, that line 16, very funny, is responding to you can't date people far away because it seems like Des hasn't seen the wink. We know that because Kay says, did you like that? So what Kay is actually having to do here is to check whether or not that wink was seen because the wink changes the nature of the tease, right? It definitely shows that it was a tease for a start, right? And it's also one of those sorts of things we do to, after a tease, we want to show that, okay, it is a tease, but we're still relationally close. And those funny winks are sort of one of those sorts of gags that are, you know, used in all sorts of things, movies and TV and things like that. And she's doing that kind of sort of false knowing, obvious, exaggerated wink so that he can see that this is clearly a tease and they can go on and do something intimate. But she has to ask him whether or not he saw it because they, you know, they are uh, in two different locations and she doesn't know what he's seen. What she does know is that he hasn't seemed to respond to the wink. He hasn't winked back, for example, right? Typically people will do that, right? Or they'll laugh or something. He doesn't do that. He does the more mournful, very funny, which is interesting. So she says, did you like that? And Des says, what did you do? So she does another wink. And he has to ask, did you wink? So it may well be that on Des's end, we can't see exactly what Des sees, but on Des's end, all of this was heavily distorted in terms of the actual video itself. Um, but he gets it. He knows that he's, she's probably winking. And she does yet another one. And she says, mm-hmm. And then he laughs, and then they can go on. So here's a pair of visuals, again, to do with relational material. Right? In a moment when it's potentially relationally just a little bit sensitive, not very sensitive, it doesn't have to be sort of the catastrophic end of the world for this sort of stuff to happen. But it's very interesting that otherwise that kind of restored wink would just be let pass entirely. So here's one of the most interesting sorts of, of responses. Um, it's uh, trouble as, as a resource for teasing. I've also got another one which is a joke as well, but I thought I'll, I'll leave the joke, uh, the joke one out. The teasing is more interesting. Um, so this is the couple who were distorted 42% of the time, and they're just having horrendous time. And this is at the end of a particularly horrendous call. And um, uh, Hal here on, the, on your left is totally frozen. He has been frozen for a couple of minutes before this, and they're now moving to close the call. So this is the end of the call itself. Okay. I love you too. No, do it again. Ooh. <laughs> Look, I caught it. I don't know if you can see that. I can't see it. Ah, <laughs> oh, that's too bad. In that case, I threw it with garbage. Oh, you bastard. <laughs> <laughs> Alrighty. Alright, so. Alrighty. Oh. Okay. Pause. I love you too. <laughs> so she's Stop it! <laughs> okay. He was. So we've got, a, we've got an issue with the, um, there we go. All right, so they're trying to close the call. Both of them are disrupted in different ways, or distorted in different ways. Her first blown kiss is missed again, right? Frames go missing. He doesn't respond to the blown kiss, right? I love you, and then there's this sort of weird pause. And she says, did you see it? He says, no, do it again. So sort of like the previous one with the distorted wink, you know, did you, did you like that? Did you wink? In this case, it's did you see that? No, do it again. So she has to actually do the blown kiss again. All right. So we've, we've bothered repairing 
a relationally important visual. And then Hal says, oh, well, okay, I caught it. Now, the interesting point here is not that he says it, it's that he's frozen and he's making this up. He's now at a point where he can say, he can describe any kind of situation he likes creatively and, as, as it were, do what he wants with that blown kiss. And so he teases her. He says, did you see that? She says, no, I can't. Well, in that case, I threw it away. Now, he didn't throw it away. There's nothing to throw away. But it's an interesting little creative spark. It's a tease which matters relationally. And she says, oh, you bastard. And they laugh. And then they say, all right, I love you. Goodbye. And it's all fine. It doesn't matter that he teased her and that it didn't go wrong or anything like that. What matters is that distortion was not repaired in any way for that. It was for the blow and kiss, but it wasn't repaired for this. Instead, it became a creative spark. The one that I won't have time to show you but is really interesting is where, because of blurry video, um, Kay says, your mouth doesn't move when you talk, sort of like she did before. And then he does, like Des does this ventriloquist act where he pretends to be hearing a voice off screen and he turns to the side and he hears the voice and then he looks back, he talks to Kay and keeps going and doing this all the time. It becomes a creative spark, the fact that the mouth isn't moving in, in conjunction with, this, with, the, uh, with the voice itself. All right, let's move on. Uh, the final one I want to talk to you about just quickly is this um, casting inattention as a potential technical trouble. And this is a weird thing, which is sort of remedial and sort of not. It's Des and Kay again. Um, this is actually in their first talk. It's very shortly into their first talk. What you need to know is that Kay, on, the, on your right-hand side there, is watching My Fair Lady on the television just to the side of the computer. And this is her favourite movie ever. So her attention is definitely drawn to that as much as it is to him. She asks him a question about what he's done. He starts telling that news. And then you'll see inattention rolls along. And what Des does is to not, not tease her, not ask her about, you know, are you not attending to me? He says, are you having trouble hearing me? So listen for that. How was the movie? Oh, it was good. It was very exciting. <laughs> Yeah, that's what Matt told me, but I've never seen it. What? What'd you say? Uh huh? Uh huh? I said, what'd you say? I said, Matt told me the movie was good too, but. You don't want to see it? Cute. Can you hear? Yeah, what did you say? I said you didn't want to see the movie? No. Oh, Maddie said it was a good movie too. <laughs> okay. Mm -hmm. I see. Are you watching the scary movie right now? No. <laughs> what? What? Are you going to be able to hear me again? No. Oh, it seems you, you look really confused. No. <laughs> Do your face for me. All right, so that's the, the joy of that, right? So it's very clear that in this particular situation, she's asked him to report the, you know, about the movie, and he starts to do just what she asked. But she's not paying attention to his answers. He gets to the end of answers and then he you know, produces sort of next responses which would then uh, propose that she should say something to him. But she veers off over here. She's looking at My Fair Lady all the time. And it keeps happening to the point where, in fact, she basically restarts the conversation halfway through. Says, you know, oh, no, Maddie didn't want to see it. What he does in response, and I'm sort of zipping through this very quickly, what he does in response is he does ask, you know, are you watching a movie? She says, no. And he says, are you having trouble hearing me again? Right? They've had a little bit of trouble before. They might be having some trouble now. And she says no. And she's sort of caught lying. And they do then this little um, sort of uh, moment where, they're, where, where she, he's asking her the question of, um, um, you know, are you watching a movie? And she's pretending to say no, but he also can see where her eyes are and see that she's doing it. And then she does that sort of big, sort of funny eye roll thing. So the point here is that what you've got is this little moment of interaction when it makes sense to actually ask whether the problem is technological. Because if Des wanted, they could have gotten into quite a serious barney about the fact that she's clearly not watching. So what does this mean? What does it add up to, all these bits and pieces? 
what I'm interested in here is this concept of local accountability, right? The point where we've got people who are trying to account for the distortion and they're trying to maintain a relationship as it's happening at the same time. But they're not treating these things as just threshold issues. They're not treating them as undifferentiated negatives. They're not treating them as just noise which has to be repaired or remedied in some way. What they're doing instead is concentrating on continuity. What they want to do is to keep going in some way. And to establish that kind of continuity means they've got to intertwine their engagement with the technology and an active relationship at the same time. So they're not just being a couple. They're doing being a couple. That's an active engagement. It's an active achievement. And they're doing being a couple via video calling. They know that they're within the frame. The frame is inescapable. And indeed, not only is the literal frame of the screen inescapable, so too are these distortions. You've got to do something about them. What's particularly interesting is that, uh, as has been the case for a very long time, audio and video are treated as parallel channels. They're not combined channels. And audio is given primacy, sort of a classic, uh, a classic finding. But video becomes a highly performative channel. Now, it always is, in a sense. But it's particularly importantly performative when it comes to fixing video trouble. It's almost like if the trouble occurs to do with video, it's either completely ignored or what it gets is these very creative sort of dramatic moments where they actually spend some time creatively enacting their relationship in interesting little ways like pretending to be ventriloquists or um, deliberately lying and showing they're having fun lying to one another. So taking this to a sort of a, a bigger picture, how do you design for the relationship between society and and technology. This image, by the way, is taken from a 1930s German cartoon called The End of the World. Um, and it shows one of the first depictions of mobile video telephony. Uh, they've got these big cases on their sides, which you can't see in the particular image of all the technology. But they're talking to these things, and they're, and they're talking. It looks like, to, looks like a, a, a young child in green. The yellow lady's talking to a young child in green, and then the, the red lady's talking to. It's unclear whether that's also a child or maybe a young man. Um, nevertheless, using it very much in a you know, domestic and a personal kind of sense. This is the sort of thing that we've wanted to do for a very long time. And yet, here we are still talking about the tricky bits of how you design for the relationship between society and technology. So the old question, the classic sociological question, is where does the power lie in trying to figure out um, where the causes are of societal change? Is it technology or is it people, effectively? So technological determinism says that technology is a driver of social phenomena rather than sort of implicated in social relations. And social constructivism says that technological artifacts have no inherent properties outside of what people actually do, right? outside of people's human interpretive work. Uh, that actually comes from, from Hutchby. He says that right? reading technologies as texts. Now, it's sort of an interesting kind of question. But as Castell says, it's kind of an irrelevant question, right? The dilemma of technological determinism is probably false, he says, since technology is society, and society cannot be understood or represented without its technological tools. So it's still an interesting debate in a sense, but it doesn't really help you do anything. I think there's a better question, and the better question has actually been asked by a range of different theorists in a range of different ways. And I would boil it down to a version of what Goffman says, which is, where is the action? Right? So adaptive structuration, activity theory, actor network theory, distributed cognition, praxeology, habitus, all those sorts of highly sociological kinds of theories look at not is technology doing it or is society doing it, but how is it actually done in moments. It might be done in very small moments, it might be done between people and artifacts, but in one way or another it's always looking for the action, what is going on to make society be the way it is. Right, for people to be able to say the things that they're saying. Um, in computer-supported collaborative work in HCI, there's this concept of local accountability. It's been around for a really long time, um, certainly since, since Suchman and, and uh, um, <laughs> Professor Harper, of course, and many others. So there's been that. And then recently, there's been dwelling, felt life, the sociability stuff, which has also been talked about by Harper and others, uh, and uh, Likop and others, sort of a more ethnographic look at where is the actual action. What we're interested in here is this, this concept of the fact that we know that people have to do things with technologies. They always have to do them. Asking whether or not the technology is making them do it is never going to get you to any kind of answer. Right? You're always going to be able to argue about whether or not they're doing it. What we need to do is to find out what people do with those technologies in those moments and then design for a fit. So you've got to design for the local accountability of action. 
So accountability, this ethnomethodological concept of accountability, it underpins both the products and the practices of design at the same time. And these are fitted to the society in which they take their place, right? Products and practices are fitted to societies, they're parts of societies, and they produce things that are parts of societies. Technological affordances, the actual stuff that we're using, are artifactual resources then. They are things to make meaning with. Right? But we do this in creative and very fluid ways. They're usually self-explicating. That is, the ways that we do it don't rely on us telling one another, and now I'm doing this via technology. We just do it and expect the other person to figure out that there must be an order here and then to follow along with that kind of order. And that can be ritualistic. We could have done it before. Or it might be, as in the cases of video calling, quite opportunistic and made up just on the spot and maybe never seen again. But it doesn't mean that it's idiosyncratic and not relevant. What we're trying to figure out here is what is the principle by which the reasoning to get through these situations is done and thereby how to design to allow that kind of reasoning, right? How to treat the accountability of technology, not just features as the focus of user engagement, and to treat designing of accountability in terms of where that action is, where users are treating method met methodical orderness as being at stake how they create the order that they need to understand the societies going on. So just quickly then, a couple of projects which could flow from this. But this, by the way, is the 1927 first demonstration of two-way technology uh, by Walter Gifford. I think he's talking to Herbert Hoover, actually. Uh, and those are his engineers standing around. Um, so it's sort of three projects which come out of this, um, all of which have these poetic uh, names, which are just sort of fun. So from conundrums to communion is all about technology failures. Clearly, they happen all the time, and video conferencing has plenty of them, not just distortions within it, but also all the problems that are associated with actually setting the stuff up and getting going. What it means to make sense of those as part of using the technology itself. They matter to the technology. Whether or not it's hard to get things going, technology adoption would say, well, that might be a barrier to adoption. Well, it sort of is. But people do it anyway if they're motivated. And that's what we've got to try and figure out. When they're motivated to try and you know, talk between grandparents and grandkids, they really want to do it, they'll figure out a way. We need to see how they're figuring out those ways all the way, right, from the moment when they're trying to turn on the computer and stop the virus checker and all those sorts of things to the moment when they're actually doing stuff. Uh, the next kind of project I'm interested in is one on intimate looking, so looking particularly at, at uh, video and video conferencing and the performativity of this, the way in which people are developing performative modes, sort of like the things we saw where people are talking about, um, talking about what it means to look at one another. And then finally, this idea of some, from code to communion, which is really about the software developers themselves. I realize that time is getting short, so I'll just quickly go through them. The first one is the easy one, right? That there are more problems than just distortion. Uh, interestingly, underneath the Gizmodo article about Skype saying that it can support video calls, the first response is somebody saying, well, that's really nice, but whenever I try and do stuff, uh, there's, uh, whenever, I, whenever I Skype, the first 15 minutes of the call consists of me trying to understand what's going on at the other end. Cameras connect to the Ethernet port, full system virus scan coinciding with the call, disconnecting, reconnecting, waiting for reboots, while my blood pressure skyrockets. And then they talk about social stuff of corralling kids. All these things are part of what it means to use technology. But these things have been dealt with in some literature, but not in detail in terms of what does it mean to actually create technology which acknowledges that. The Intimate Looking Performativity Project is uh, really looking at what it means to figure out how to look at one another to do who we are and what we're doing via video calling. It's based on uh, uh, Goodwin's uh, idea of professional vision, but obviously re recontextualizing it, and performativity, and also technologized technologize interaction in a at a distance. And the third project that I think is particularly interesting is the fact that if you look at all this prior stuff that I've done, as cool as it all is, if I may say so myself, um, is the developers are missing, right? It's all sort of post facto evaluation, 10, 8, 4, which is interesting. It certainly does tell you, in a sense, how to design to get better scores, but it does leave out a whole point of well, the fact is developers are part of this. They're part of the technology. The practices, their cultural practice of developing the software, make it into the technology in some kind of way, and we don't know enough about that. We don't know a lot about, for example, what developers themselves think about interactions. What theories do they have about interactions? They've got lay theories, but have they been explicated? I haven't seen it. And then how do those things, whatever they may be, become designs, and then code, and then active features, and of course changing uh, through each of those modes? Um, it's interesting to try and figure out what the principles are by which software engineers treat their own training and the infrastructure, the management requirements, all that sort of stuff, as practical resources for making professional judgments, which then go into designs and code and active features. 
Uh, and of course, you don't have just one culture. There's lots of different engineering cultures. You've got agile cultures, you've got you know, older cultures, different sorts of cultures, and they have to merge one way or another, especially now as you're having sort of this, this merger-based, uh, acquisition-based um, technology growth. Um, this is happening more and more. So clearly this is the kind of important uh, cultural issue that matters to both the actual um, the industry, sort of quiet industry, but also to the features that are produced in the interactions. So on that basis, ask me anything. Just one, one clarification. There was a meeting with Michelle. Uh, we have another talker at um, 10. So we, for her, we need to sort of scarf that. But anyone got any questions? Uh, yep. I'm sorry I arrived late uh, because uh, I got confused. Um, I, I don't know if you mentioned the methodology. Maybe at the beginning you did. Yep. Uh, okay, so if it's a repetition, I can ask you later if you don't want to answer right? because if it's a rep I don't want you to uh, to lose time, I don't know, <laughs> to waste time. Well, just, well, just briefly, um, I'm an ethnomethodologist, which means that I'm a qualitative sociologist um, and I collect naturally occurring interactions and then I sort of examine those line by line. Um, and I'm trying to figure out principles of ordinary reasoning in those collections. And what I'm trying to do is to create collections of practices of, of reasoning, basically, which are done in the moment by people to establish what they're doing as, in some way, socially orderly. Yeah, so what interested me was like, the technology adopted for registering uh, the, uh, the video call uh, and uh, how, my, how, long, how, how long they were. Like, uh, I, I was interested in the, into the details of the methodology, uh, since it seems to be complex, or at least uh, I don't know how many couples you did examine. And, uh, oh, okay, yeah, that, that is in the slides. I mean, I'm happy to tell you, but I don't know whether anybody else wants to ask a question, but there were, there were six couples. Um, they, did a, they were two, in two-month trials. They could talk whenever they liked. There were no set tasks. Um, I knew that troubles would, uh, you know, distortions would occur endogenously, and so I just waited for those. And I was interested in waiting for those moments when the couples themselves acknowledged some audio or video distortion and then made something of it, right? Tried to cope with it so that they could continue the interaction. There were 145 cases of those, and they ba basically split up into three kinds of ways of coping. Trying to fix the technology with bandwidth sliders and stuff like that was about 40%. About 30% of the time they tried to fix the actual content itself, what went wrong and trying to repeat that content. And about 31% of the time they did other things which were non-remedial coping strategies. And what they basically did was they used the fact that distortion was occurring as a resource to make meaning. And in this case, because they were couples, they were usually doing that to make relational meaning. In other words, they were enacting their relationship by talking through the distortion and doing something creative and interesting with it.